teach a new course. And the, uh, the instructor who had been teaching the course uh, gave me his slides, kind of a, a nice gesture. And, uh, and the first year I taught the course, I, I used those slides. And um, so I just showing here a, a, a few of the slides that I was uh, uh, given to start with. And, um, you know, this was, uh, I, and, and I used these uh, the, the first year I taught the course. And, and, and I'm just curious, at, at a first glance, what, what's your first impression of this slide as, as, as students uh, uh, sitting, watching, what, what, any, any thoughts here? <clears throat> so pretty generic, Isadora is saying, look simple, uh, kind of dull, boring, yeah. Um, I think these were <clears throat> kind of uh, the, the sentiments of the students the first year I had the course and then for myself, I just, I couldn't make it work. So I, I revised it um, to a, a more visual, uh, simpler kind of presentation. And, um, you know, I'm not sure that this was, was uh, uh, all for the best, but it, it, it certainly took away the monotony of the, the, the straight bullet points. Um, now, the, the, the second slide that I inherited was this one here. And um, it's kind of a little bit more of, of the same uh, as the first one that I showed you, but uh, kind of more of it. And uh, I think most of us find that we wouldn't really want to have to get through it all. And so again, I kind of had a challenge there what to do. So I built on the slide that I had created and then built again, uh, adding, adding new information. And to me, and I think to the students who were part of that course, uh, a kind of more effective way to, to get through that, that information. And um, the, I guess one message here is that you know not only building visual slides but building slides that have builds or or, or animations transitions in the slide uh, give you a lot for a little so you can take a base slide build it and there's a kind of good economy and a good opportunity to develop a kind of a sustained idea uh, by doing so and, and just while you're watching, um, uh, the font here, I think, is uh, Gil Sons, uh, I believe, yeah. Um, so I'm curious, what do you think, what do you think the, the font size is uh, down at the bottom? Any, any thoughts on that as you take a look at this? 20, 20, 48, 30, so we're getting a little bit of range there. So this one's 40, it's a 40, a 40 font certainly large enough. Um, now, what do you think this? A little bit smaller, what would you say? Thirty-six. Okay, thirty-two. Now getting down even further, what do you think this is? Twenty-four. And then down here, we get down to 18 and 18 is getting pretty hard to uh, work with, right? And uh, 32 going back is, is pretty comfortable. So as you're designing your slides, kind of keep, keep this in mind. Uh, often when we try to either get too much into a slide or we're not sure where to put something, we start to reduce font sizes and um, Hard to, hard to read. So create slides that are visual and consider using builds uh, to generate kind of sustained discussion on a particular point. So um, a few Zoom tips. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of curious before, before I, I begin here, um, you know, do you do you anticipate that in a year or two we're going to kind of forget about Zoom? 
I know Peter was talking to us uh, before class started, showing us some of the things he's doing with his new computer, but worrying that in a year from now, maybe we won't be using this anymore. And so I've got a quick poll here. I'm just curious. Uh, Oh, I've got to start this one again. I don't think it's going to show. Sorry, let me try this again. Hmm. I guess you can see the poll, but I can't launch it. I launched it earlier. And once it's been launched, I'm not sure how to relaunch it. Anyways, the question here was, Will telecommuting become more widespread in the global workforce after COVID? Ah, Can I just, I just yeah, okay, let's see. Um, you know, I think that there's... Um, reason to believe that, um, that things may sort of, uh, you know, certainly the, the, the remote working style that we've started to develop during COVID may, uh, may become part of the norm that many, uh, many companies may see that there's good value in um, the kind of remote working environment that we've now become familiar with. So I can see that, uh, uh, 76% of you um, see that that certainly could be the case. And um, uh, so interesting that, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly doing this now, but it may be something that we'll be doing for, for some time to come. And um, just get that down. So a few of the recommendations uh, for using Zoom for, for OP1. And, uh, you know, we can certainly consider this for OP2 as well. Uh, engage your audience. Uh, you know, as I did, I had a little bit of difficulty here with the poll, but polling is, 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 is one way to connect with your classmates. Uh, encourage chat. We've got very active chat in, in our lectures here. It's a good way for us to, to be connecting. Uh, you can ask for kind, you know, students to use an emoji, to use a, uh, a thumbs up to let them know that they agree with you on a certain point. Um, making eye contact, uh, looking into the camera when you're presenting, um, and keeping your camera on when, uh, when your team is presenting. Uh, you know, we, as I mentioned yesterday, it's not a hard requirement. Uh, some of you may not have cameras uh, or maybe, uh, you know, extremely uncomfortable using them, but we're, we're definitely encouraging for OP1 and OP2 that you, you kind of seize the moment, take that opportunity. Um, tidy up your background. If you're uh, in a, a kind of a, a cluttered working space, you might want to think about uh, tidying up the background or using, as I do, using a, a, a virtual background. Um, as you've already started to do, most of you are already uh, accustomed to muting audio. We, we can by default have the, the, the audio muted when you enter the room. And uh, again, to reiterate from yesterday, practice recording yourself, recording your team on Zoom, give each other feedback. Uh, on vocal delivery, let your teammates know whether you're, you're audible, whether you're clear, whether the pace is effective, whether you're sounding kind of natural, engaged. Uh, you can get some feedback on lighting. I know for me, my lighting's a bit dim, <clears throat> perhaps not the best. Um, and you might consider using a second monitor. I'm not sure if some of you have, have, have done that with, with other presentations that you might have given uh, with, with Zoom, where you can share your, your full screen presentation slide deck with the audience and then view the, the presenter view on a second display. Now, the, the, the trade-off there or the possible 
problem is that then you're not kind of connecting with your audience. So you would want to practice with that to be able to either pick up some key points from your second monitor, but not rely on it and become uh, disengaged with, with your audience. So that's kind of a tricky one. And uh, yeah, using sidecar, that's one way, certainly with, with, with Max, it works well. Um, and practice with your CI. We've got some time coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, so you can get in there, start to practice with your feet, with your, with your presentation and get, get some feedback. Um, so going forward to vocal delivery, um, you know, having looked at the rubric that that's one of the things that we'll be assessing in, in, in OP1. And projection is, is kind of, it's not only vocal power, but it's that you're, you're using your voice powerfully, clearly, that you're using it to kind of command respect and attention. And pace is that when it comes to public speaking that you're using a, you're speaking at a kind of a conversational pace, which is usually between 140 to 170 words um, a minute. And um, I thought we could take a look at a, at just a couple of, of, of video clips. Uh, these are, are, well, one is a journalist, both of them are, 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 are from, from journalism. And, and I think that we can learn quite a bit from journalists. After all, they are in front of the camera delivering to the public regularly. So when you have a chance to watch an experienced uh, uh, television or online journalist, we, we, we might be able to pick up some, some good practices. So I just want to show this quick uh, quick clip here, and then get your your thoughts on the effectiveness of the the vocal projection and pace. You have to be able to get past the lens. Some people just look like they are reading an autocue, but the ones who can really do it get through the lens into people's homes and make eye contact. There isn't a route to becoming a news presenter. Most people have either been producers or correspondents. And as they've become more and more confident on camera, somebody or other says, well, why don't you have a go? Your primary motivation has got to be journalism, not being on TV. Too many people just like the idea of being on TV and reading the news. Actually, this job is about journalism. It's live television journalism in the studio and out. Ultimately, your job is to tell people what's going on, to interview people, to, to broadcast and, and be an anchor. And if technical things go wrong, which they do, it doesn't really matter. You've just got to carry on uh, and remember what you're there to do. You've got to be motivated as a television journalist to find things out, to break stories, to hold people to account. And if you can do all of that and communicate on camera, you can be a news presenter. Okay, good, good. So. Um... Curious what, 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 you, what you think. What are your first impressions of this, uh, this speaker? Um, the vocal projection kind of commanding uh, our interest and, and the pace. Um, yeah, uh, Tashif, I think it's good. It's good, clear speaking. Uh, the camera angles were a bit weird because he's, speak, he's being interviewed. So he's speaking to someone who's interviewing him and just giving his, his insights into effective uh, journalistic presentation. Um, uh, it was maybe a bit blurry. Okay, sorry if I, I was getting a fairly clear image, but um, maybe, that, maybe the image uh, uh, was not so clear. Um, the one thing I, I, I kind of particularly liked is, is his energy. Right, that that he that, that kind of commitment to your subject is is hard to replace, and when you have someone who has that kind of of, of energy, um, it's kind of infectious, right? It 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 it, it makes us in the audience uh, kind of feel that excitement, 
And so I liked that he was uh, uh, bringing that, that, that kind of excitement and, and his pace is pretty good, right? It, it, it's moving along quickly, but it's, it, it, it's not just at one level. He has little ups and downs. Uh, and of course we get the sense that he's speaking naturally. And that's a, a great quality to, that, that, you know, we all want to, you know, try, try to do that ourselves. And I just want to look at another quick um, clip uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll discuss after. And joining me now is Canada's finance minister and deputy prime minister, Christia Freeland. Thank you for making the time this evening. Great to be with you, Rosie. Um, clearly, as you articulated today, you expect this next period uh, to be difficult for, for Canadians and for all of Canada and, and businesses, given that you have now prolonged some of your big measures even further and increased that support. Can, can you tell Canadians how the drawdown of that support coincides with the rollout of the vaccine? Are the two connected and how are they connected? Uh, that is a great question, Rosie, and they absolutely are connected. We finally do see real light at the end of the tunnel. We know now that this pandemic is going to come to an end, and Canada has a the world's best portfolio of vaccines that we have purchased. So we're going to get vaccinated. And that means that we know while we have a few tough winter months ahead, spring is going to come and we're going to be able to get back to normal life. Okay, so we have Christian Freeland, now our, our Minister of Finance, and Rosemary Barton from CBC, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Chief Political Correspondent for Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, uh, speaking with her. What do you think of, uh, particularly of, of Christia Freeland? Uh, any thoughts on her, her vocal projection, uh, pace? So as, as Sarah mentions in the chat here, it's, it's a slower pace. Um, does that interfere with the effectiveness or might that be uh, perhaps a good thing? Um, it's certainly different than the, the first presenter that we saw. Um, <clears throat> Sarah says it might be purposeful that she's making uh, kind of serious, deliberate points about the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And so that might be purposeful on her part. When, when I first listened to it in, in comparison and contrast with the, the first presenter, I thought, oh, she's kind of slow. It's kind of slow. But um, uh, you can see that there's there's some range there, some difference between the two. Um, uh, sort of saying that she repeats the same thing a, a couple of times, and and that might be intentional. It might be that on national television she's wanting to make sure that her point gets across. Not sure. Um, and so for an average watcher, she keeps repeating the key point again and again, slowly. So maybe that's not so effective in, in, in your eyes. Um, uh, you know, generally I think she's a pretty good speaker. I like her, which is why I was interested to see how she kind of performed here in this situation. But um, uh, Trevor says that the tone might come across a little bit as talking down. Okay, so that's interesting. So maybe her tone is not um, uh, that uh, kind of uh, positive or, or, or uh, um, kind of encouraging. So that might uh, be a factor for some. So, so anyways, I, I show these to you because I think they're both they're, they're both pretty good speakers. Um, they're quite different. And when you yourself watch yourself and watch your teammates. Um, you certainly want to be uh, respectful in your responses and, and, and encouraging, but also you want to be able to point out where they might be able to make uh, improvement. And so um, anyways, we've got to start here in our, in our analysis of, of vocal projection and uh, pace. So just to close up with vocal delivery, uh, filler words, the ums, the likes, 
the, all those mm, are, ooh, ahs. Uh, how do we stop using those filler words? And there's, there's quite a bit of study. There was a study in the, the Harvard Business Review on this that had some, some interesting findings uh, and some interesting suggestions. First, to identify your crutch words. What is it that you habitually do? Which words do you fall on? Is it the like, the um, the so, the mm? And each time you use your crutch word, develop a physical response. It could be just tapping yourself. It could be maybe squeezing your wrist a little bit, just showing some awareness that you are using that crutch word. And by showing that awareness, you perhaps are better able to reduce your use of the crutch word. Um, um, see, here I go myself. And instead of using the crutch words, consider pausing. Give yourself a moment to collect your thoughts, calm your nerves. It can also be an opportunity to build a little bit of suspense. We know that if your delivery is without any variation in speed or without any pauses, that you tend to lose your audience. So this is a good opportunity, instead of using the crutch word, to use a pause. And finally, their advice is simply to prepare so as to calm your nerves, because it's usually nervousness that brings this use of the crutch words on. And the recommendation here, at least three full runs in front of an audience to calm your nerves. <clears throat> so what I want to do is, is have you, just as a quick breakout uh, activity, I want you for <clears throat> one minute, have one of your group members in the breakout room, explain your favorite engineering course so far and why. So should be something that's pretty easy to get you started talking about something you know, give a few reasons why, do this for a minute, try to speak as clearly as possible. And then the, the listening group members are going to count the filler words, the ums, the ahs, the likes, the so's, uh, assess the vocal projection, the, 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 the confidence and the authority of the, the speaking, and also assess the vocal pace. Is it seem like it's at a reasonable pace, too fast, too slow? And then for the last two minutes of the breakout, uh, the two or three listening members of the group will give feedback to that one member who has presented. And, and for this uh, breakout exercise, I, I highly encourage you to turn your cameras on. This would be a good opportunity to start to become more uh, comfortable with this. So I'm gonna post in the chat, I'll post the these instructions so you can refer to them. And I'm just going to stop the share here and open up the file. So you should see in the chat the, uh, the slide with the instructions for the, for the breakout. And I will now organize the breakout rooms. And we've got 75, so maybe I'll do six. Good, so hopefully you're being sent now. Okay, excellent. I, <clears throat> I hope everyone is, uh, is back with us now. And uh, um, I'm going to turn it over in just a second to, to Professor Betts. Um, what we'll do is you'll have a chance to continue with this exercise uh, in, in your CI meetings. Uh, it's a good way to get some quick feedback on not only your, your verbal habits, uh, the kinds of tics you have, but also your pace and your your, your inflection and your projection. 
So uh, we'll get a chance to work on this more uh, in, the, in the CI meetings, but hopefully you got some good insights uh, in this brief session. So Vaughn, I'll turn it over to you now and you can uh, pick up with your slides. Thanks, Ken. Can you can you hear me okay? Yeah, gotcha. Okay, and uh, just getting all the video settings where I want them. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little more about uh, slide design with uh, Dr. Tallman for oral presentation one. Okay, so whenever you're making a, a presentation, the first thing you want to do is, as Dr. Tallman talked about earlier in the course, is you identify what is your core message, what's the essence of what you want to communicate, and also who are your audience. So in this presentation, what is your core measure, me message? Uh, your core intent from a made to stick point of view, what do you want the audience to remember? And then you also want to think, who is my audience? So that means what do they care about? How are you going to engage their issue or their interest? Because if they're not interested, they're not going to remember anything anyway. And you need to think about how much they know about this topic. So you avoid the curse of knowledge, you set your content at an appropriate level. So, so what do you think? What's your core message in this presentation? What are you trying to get across? Your core intent is to get a good mark. Uh, that is actually your core intent. So I absolutely agree, right? You're, you're, that's what you even want. Okay. So, but you have to think of now, how do you, how are you going to get to that good mark? So you're going to have to take that core intent and think of what's the path towards that. Is your GIS usable and responsive? So that's part of your core intent. Do you, uh, did you do a good job? because that's how you're gonna get a good mark, right? Convince your CI that you did a good job on, on this milestone. Okay, so the model of, of the graphics review, oral presentation one is, it's a review of a project that's underway. And this happens all the time and happens throughout your career in industry, happens in academia as well. So this is, we're modeling a formal review with upper management. Your CI is like your upper management. They're not your immediately supervisors, so they're not interested in all the low level details, but they do wanna know how is this project going? Is it on, on track or not? So they wanna know what's the vision and motivation for this project uh, in a meeting like this with upper management. So is it a clear vision, it's compelling, I buy into it, or is it baffling or non-existent? So that's one of the, and I've done many of these reviews with upper management. So I did them when I was in industry at Altera with, uh, you know, the head of R&D with the CEO. So they want to know, do you know what you're doing? You know, why are we doing this? Does it make sense? So that's one of the things you're trying to communicate to your CI, that you do know why you're doing this. It does make sense. Uh, in academia, I do presentations like this too with uh, research funding sponsors. And again, I want to convince them this makes sense, you should keep funding this. The other thing that you wanna get across in a review presentation like this is, you know, how is it going? Okay, so what is the goal? Does that make sense? But now how is it going? So the best answer would be, you know, the team's executing well, we're making good progress. So maybe milestone two has gone really well and you just gotta get that across. Now that may not be the case. Maybe milestone two didn't go as well as you'd like. So you, you can see when you show pictures or video of your map that there are problems and that's okay. So you can still do well in this review. You, you acknowledge there are some difficulties, but you show the team has a credible plan to overcome them and, and still execute well. So again, in an upper review with upper management, that's also an okay message. You wouldn't want to just put up, uh, here are pictures that don't look good the program. We do a demo and the program crashes, but we're going to say this is fantastic. Well, no, it's not fantastic. Better to acknowledge the difficulties, but say, how, how do we get here? How do we get out of that? The worst thing you want to do in either this presentation or, you know, the, what this is modeling a review with upper management is things aren't going well, but we don't know how to recover. Maybe we don't even understand they're not going well. I mean, that's bad. So in, in some of these high stakes presentations that I've had in industry, you know, the outcome is, oh, that team looks like they're in really big trouble. 
they need more supervision from upper management. Maybe they need a change in team composition. Like we need to take this team off this project, et cetera. Now that's not going to happen here, but that means your CI would give you not a very good grade because you don't quite seem to understand that things aren't going well. You don't seem to have a recovery plan. Okay, so your core message and intent is, you're right, the underlying core message is give me a good mark, but you can't go out and just say that, put on a bunch of slides, give me a good mark. What you want to do is convince your CI, we have a vision that is for this project that is clear and compelling, you buy into it, and either we're doing well, uh, and we can demonstrate that, or we had some difficulties, but we acknowledge them, and we have a plan of how to do better. That's convincing the CI the project's worthwhile and you can deliver it, which is going to convince your CI that you should get a good mark. And the CI is looking at how you convey that message. You know, is it memorable? Is it well crafted? So it's not just the message, it's the how of you make the CI remember it. Okay, so audience is your CI. We already talked about this, represents your upper management or a client. Those are kind of similar. Um, you want to impress your CI. Uh, your other audience are your peers. They're going to be on the Zoom call too. And, and can give you some feedback, but they're not assigning your grade, so they're not your primary audience. You want to avoid the curse of knowledge. So in a presentation like this, you know a lot about what you just did for milestone two. Don't assume the audience knows what you know. Don't assume they know why something is important. Um, you need to explain why things are important or you immediately lose your audience. Diving deep into some tricky code detail would be really bad. Your CI probably doesn't care that much about that, and pretty much nobody's going to follow some tricky code detail in, in an oral presentation. Okay, so that sounds kind of obvious, but it's amazing how, how often people fall into the curse of knowledge. Assuming the audience knows what they know, assuming the audience cares about what they care about. So this is a real story. So Fidel Castro, a former dictator of Cuba, gave a three hour speech on Che Guevara, uh, Latin American revolutionaries, application of dialectics. Okay, so that sounds pretty esoteric. So what is that? Dialectic is a word that my older brother is a, a professor of English. Uh, so he uses this word a lot and I always have to look it up. So the art of investigating or discussing the truth of opinions, which is still actually kind of hard to understand. So. This is, it's kind of like a, uh, a void star star in C++. Like that's a pointer to a pointer to nothing. Uh, so this is kind of a hard word to get your head around. Like, what does this really mean? Even when you look up the definition. Okay, so who was his audience for this relatively esoteric speech that was very detailed because it's three hours long, you know? Maybe it's academics like my brother who are really into this. Uh, no. It was actually to an audience of six-year-olds uh, in a kindergarten class where he was discussing this. So you got to imagine this was not a compelling discussion for these six-year-olds. Don't do that, right? So think about what your audience wants to know and uh, don't go into details they don't care about. All right, so you figured out your core intent. And it sounds obvious, but sometimes people don't think about what am I really trying to get across? And just like any other project management, make a plan, and in this case, that's, you know, it's an outline and who's going to do what. So what are your key points? What's interesting to your audience? What will show that your team and your project are good? Uh, so you might focus on fast response time that is detailed but usable. And Dr. Tallman and I are going to focus on our killer app feature, adapting to the environment with night, night, night mode. You know, so take some time, discuss this, figure out what are things that you believe you can craft a good presentation around. Okay, once you got the high level points you're trying to get across, you, you need to make an outline. So what slides are we gonna have and who owns each? So basically agile development, quickly make an outline so you can divide up the work. So maybe we're gonna basically try to catch the audience's uh, attention by giving a history of GISs from the Roman empire to today. I'm not saying it's a great idea, but that's our idea to try to hook the audience. We're gonna talk a bit about response time. We're gonna talk about usability. And we're gonna talk about our, our extra feature night mode. So making this outline is useful because we, we can work out our time budget. You've only got eight to 10 minutes. So roughly a separator slide for me takes about zero minutes. So I put separator slides in that's kind of signposts of where am I in the presentation, remind you what I'm talking about. So those are zero minutes and a content slide for me on average is about a minute. 
So we actually can't make very many slides, about 10 content slides and that's it. Uh, so we're gonna make this outline, we're gonna revise, make sure it fits in the time budget. And then we're gonna assign owners. So just like dividing up our coding, so we can say who makes what slide. So Ming is gonna have two minutes and make these slides. Sue's got two minutes, Jasmine's got four and so on. So we make work out our time budget and who's gonna make what slide. Why do we do this? Uh, creating good slides is actually very time consuming. So it's faster to refine your plan now than after the slides are made. You don't wanna make 25 beautiful slides and then throw 15 of them way, away. So refine this outline. You could get parallel development going by assigning ownership of slides to different people. And so it's project management. Write down your commitments, divide up the work, get going. And then you're gonna refine. So again, use agile development. So get, get slides going, make an early slide deck. You can practice without the slides being really beautiful. You can see what works and what doesn't and throw out slides, change them, etc. As Dr. Tomlin said, be visual. Try not to use too much text. Try to use graphics instead. So keep your slides simple. The audience won't understand complex slides. If you have more text on your slides, they generally are listening to you less. You spend your time reading the slide, not listening to the speaker. So the former CEO of Altera was actually a fantastic speaker. He's kind of spellbinding to listen to. It was one of the reasons that he was CEO. And he had a philosophy if he put almost nothing on the slides or he'd speak without slides. And he said, this makes him look smarter because he's telling you things that aren't on the slides. And it's, it is interesting. After he told me this, I watched him and it does make you think he's smarter because he's telling you statistics and things that aren't written down. And that makes you think, wow, he must be really smart. But he's looked them up in advance. He just hasn't written them on the slides. I wouldn't go as far as he did though with this. I would put the key points on the slides, but succinctly point form, not too many words, try to get them down to the essence. Why is this? Some people are visual. I'm very visual. I can read faster than I can listen to someone. So I retain more by seeing the key points. It also helps the presenter because your, your very brief notes are on the slide. They're not full sentences, so you're not tempted to read them, but they will help you remember what am I going to talk about next. So I like this, this balance. And if you think, if I didn't put much on the slides, it's I will look smarter. That's kind of a good, good way to think about it. You're going to add something beyond just what's on the slide. Okay, how do you practice? So Dr. Tolman took about the, talked about this. Speak out loud, set it up to be as real as possible. Have Zoom going, put the screen where it would be, time yourself, work to get a smooth but natural sounding delivery. And recording yourself and watching is a good idea. Um, if a slide is hard to speak to, then you need to go back after you've tried to speak to it a few times and you just can't find the right words. Well, that tells you that slide needs to be edited or refined. So this is gonna be agile. You're gonna go back and, and change things. If you just don't meet the time budget, then you're gonna to have to go back all the way to your outline and, and change it, cut some slides. Most teams try to fit too much in. It's a very common thing. And it is a key skill of how do you fit within a certain time budget? So my students will have you know work that they've something that research they've worked on for two years and they got to fit it into a 20 minute presentation. So they have to figure out what's the essence, how am I going to get this across? You have to do it too in this presentation. Okay, so leave your time, yourself time for iteration. You want to do agile development here. Okay, so that, that, that's kind of how I would recommend you attack this um, mouse or this oral presentation. But let's go through some examples to make this concrete. Okay, so here's, the first slide on that extra feature. So this is Dr. Tolman and I, this is our killer part of our presentation. We get into our extra feature that's gonna blow away the audience. So night mode, night mode reduces brightness but maintains color contrast. All the set color calls have an extra indirection to obtain the brightness scaled color. And you can see an overview of how that works down here. What do you think? So I see Peter is not liking, liking this. Uh, segmentation fault okay so isidore believes i've crashed myself uh yeah it can yes yeah, so my audience doesn't care about how it works what am i doing showing them code uh what does this mean yeah i don't know what it means it's hard to understand it's not the core essence they don't care and they don't understand it's like a double fail your your goal is to make them care and make them understand and you failed both so really bad okay uh dr tallman anything you would say about this? What do you think? 
Well, and and I'd wonder why that why that first bullet point's important. Why is night mode important at all? You, 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 we know you tell us it reduces brightness, maintains color contrast, but so so what? Why? Why? Yeah. Why should I care? Yeah. So there is no why. There, the, they don't say why we should do this. Nobody cares. It's wordy. We didn't make this simple. What is our core purpose? Who knows? Inappropriate for the audience. Uh, it's not very visual, so it's not very concrete. Lots of words that people can absorb quickly. It, it's kind of terrible in, in all sorts of ways. Okay, here's our next try. So night mode. So our map has this night mode feature, and you can see it here. It reduces brightness for right time use. Okay, what do you think? What do you think about this second attempt? Okay, so Trevor thinks it's better. Sarah thinks it's better. So everybody thinks it's better. And I agree, it is better. Like, um, Isidore is saying there's still no explanation of why. Yeah, so it's more concrete because we're showing instead of telling. It's simpler, but we still haven't said why. So that's, that's bad. Text should be bigger. Yeah, so the visual design still not great. Uh, lots of problems. Ken, anything you'd add to that? Uh, yeah, no, I agree. I think that that's uh, the main question still is why why do we care about it? What what are we supposed to understand and and know know about this? Okay. And maybe a header, maybe a, a, an effective header would would help here. Yeah, Something that's right. We kind of wasted our real estate here. We just said night mode. Didn't didn't say why. Okay. Yeah, text is a bit small as you guys have flagged. Um didn't center the text, so even the graphic design doesn't look good. Okay, here's my our next attempt. So night mode. It takes 60 minutes for your eye to fully adapt to the dark. You a bright screen at night, therefore is visually distracting, and it can actually lead to more traffic accidents. Traffic accidents because despite the fact that we have less traffic on the roads at night, more than 40% of all the fatal car accidents occur at night. So it's important. We chose colors and road widths to reduce brightness, but maintain contrast. And we tested it with five individuals and they all preferred it to Google Maps. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, okay, so a statement of my citation is not IEEE, so refer to the Dean. Uh, so Ken, on a presentation, you can probably get by without it being IEEE format for citations. I'll, I'll throw that to you. I know in my presentations, I'll use very short format to avoid being really distracting. Yeah, we've, we've kind of recommended that either they use uh, a citation with a list of references at the end, or if it's just a single reference that they could put the information at the bottom of the slide. Um, but, yeah. uh, you know, so that's kind I, of- I think those are both make sense. So you can give the full detail at the bottom or at the end, but basically try to keep it short in the middle so you don't get bogged down with a long, a long list of like journal. You know, you try to think what is the essence that would make people understand this. Um, can we explain the why? Too many bullet points. Yeah, so it's still pretty wordy. Uh, still not clearly explaining the why. I mean, I'm trying to explain the why. I'm at least saying that a bright screen is distracting. I have a quote here. Okay, so I'm trying to do why. Maybe I haven't done it as well as I could. Still wordy. Um, I have a specific reference and I have a specific test. They could probably be more credible. Okay, so I'm trying to be credible by trying to give backing data, but I quoted some lawyer rather than a, a, an academic source. So it's not clear how accurate that is. Maybe this is a person who, you know, uh, does personal injury lawsuits, so maybe not that credible. And I do have my own personal test five people may not be the most compelling, but I'm trying, maybe I could be more credible. Okay, I'm gonna go a couple minutes over just to see if we can get through this. So let me, next, let me go through our next try. So I imagine you've all been driving at night. It's raining, it's dark, it's wet. The light is reflecting off the road and other cars and you're not quite sure where your destination is, where your friend's house really is, and you're trying to look at the map on your cell phone near you, and it's destroying your night vision because it's so bright and you could barely see to begin with. It's a very stressful situation and it can be a dangerous situation. 
Here's the solution. We put a night mode into our map so you can see the key information you need very quickly about where you're going without it destroying your night vision. Better night vision, better, safer driving. We do this with darker backgrounds and thinner lines, but we maintain contrast while reducing brightness. And we've tested this with four, four with five people and four out of five preferred our solution to Google Maps. Okay, so what do you think of that one? Uh, okay, so Isidore has a point, you know, it's only running desktop computers can't be used while driving. You can take some poetic license as you're doing this. All right, so, uh, Dr. Tallman and I are basically motivating for cars, and yeah, we'll port it to a navigation system in a car in the future. That's fine. I think uh, the CIs can weigh in, but they're going to give you that. That's okay. So I wouldn't be too literal about, I I'm going to talk about my map in the UG machine computers and exactly what it's used for. You can, you can talk about the underlying technology has this cool feature because of this. Okay, so I see we've, maybe we've got my first positive comment. So it's simple and gets the point across. So yeah, I think this is a lot better. Uh, it's more visual. And, and I like, yeah, I like the okay, bit. Sorry. I like the way that you started with the one image, then introduced the map as the solution to the problem, and then introduced the text. You know, it, it, it might have been done a little bit more elegantly, but I like the fact that you built the slide. Still, again, I think the header could be improved. The yeah, header should point. probably deliver. Still kind of underutilizing uh, that. Yeah. Yeah, that it has something to do that it enhances safety. Uh, something, right? Uh, that let us know in the header what the slide is telling us. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, but basically, to let's see to capture some of that, um, yeah, we did I think a better job of making you care. And what we used was actually story. So this wasn't a made up story. It wasn't a really specific story. It was like we can, something we can relate to, the story of driving at night to a friend's place. We don't know where we are. We're lost. So you can bring stories like that in that are, you know, realistic. It's less wordy, so it's more simple. That also means there's less chance of me reading it in the presentation. Helps me be a more dynamic speaker. What about this? This is a different way to do that same presentation. So tell the story. Have you been, I've, we've all been driving at night, it's wet, we can't see, et cetera. I could go through the same speech that I just gave, gave you, but with this as the visual. Okay. I see the sauna likes this. This is a useful technique too. Okay. So in my opinion, this is dramatic. It forces the audience to listen to you. Most of your slides have text and visuals. This one is just visual. The audience stops, they kind of look at you. They look at the picture, then they look at you know you on Zoom to see what is going on. Um, so I'm gonna tell a story, but there's also an aspect of unexpected here. Why is there only a picture? There's a knowledge gap. Why are you showing me this picture? One of my former PhD students you know, would do this in his presentations incredibly well. You know, very technical presentation, and then partway through, he would just have a picture. And it made everybody look at him and what is he talking about? And he would tell them something about that picture and then go on to the next part of the presentation. So it can be a very effective, uh, a very effective technique. Okay. Um, this last one is just a take on that two slides ago, same content as two slides ago. Um, but we just put a little more on it. So Dr. Tallman and I think this is great. We put uh, all this information down at the bottom. What do you think? Do you like it or not like it? Is this our map name? Maps are our passion. Uh, it's kind of our team slogan. So, so I see Isidore saying he thinks it's distracting. Yeah, so I'd be careful. What do you think, Ken? Do you like this or not? Well, I think it's it's kind of unnecessary, and particularly if it's going to be there for on all of the slides, picks up quite a bit of real estate. Yeah, I think I would agree. So I prefer clean slides. Some people make all sorts of headers and footers because they make a clever graphic design and carry it forward. So I've put all this stuff at the bottom. I could put University of Toronto on here and so on. You put a, a bar up here of color. 
a little bit of that can make your slides look nice, but too much is kind of distracting because especially if this shows up slide after slide, you're kind of wasting some of your audience attention and some of your real estate showing them over and over again, this kind of complicated footer. Uh, the most extreme example I've seen of this is one of my uh, undergraduate summer research students that I took on one year gave a presentation and he was doing some work with simulations of lasers. And he basically had an animated GIF of a cat chasing a laser pointer as the footer on his slide. So down here was a cat roaming about chasing a laser and every slide had that. And he presented this to you know all the grad students in my group and all of us were staring at that cat and not paying attention to him and trying to figure out why he had put this on his slides. Uh, so I would try to avoid cluttering them a lot. Uh, and let's even leave it at that for, uh, for today. So we've got a few minutes over, sorry about that, but uh, if you had to take off, we'll record it. So Great, thanks, I'll stay Paul. around for a few minutes in case there are questions. Yeah, and I'll be here for a couple of minutes as well. Thanks all for hanging in. Thanks everybody. <clears throat>
Um, you could set up your, your image as a, uh, with a figure caption uh, so that you could then have a citation with the figure caption. Uh, that that would probably be uh, the perhaps the be the better way to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, when I put citations on slides in kind of highly technical presentations, what I'll usually do is do a very short form. I usually won't do a number because I, I want people to maybe know the name of the first author and what journal it was in or what conference, if it was a prestigious conference. It's still short and then I can put the full citation at the end, as Dr. Tallman said, but it allows me when they see the citation, they can just see enough to know what journal it came from, which especially in a specialized audience can be useful because they know, yeah, that's that's a pretty good journal. Um, but I won't put the full citation generally in the body because it's too distracting. <clears throat> and I'll instead relegate the full citation to either a, you know an end note or a footnote. <clears throat> experience um, I've been kind of before going over the instructions in the rubric I've been focusing on 227 the moment in his presentation when everything goes wrong uh, <laughs> that's pretty funny uh, it takes a certain kind of uh, bravado to, to handle that and uh, yeah it was uh, I, I it was a great choice good job it, it, it's kind of a brilliant moment, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's a, cata a catastrophe, but a, a beautiful catastrophe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Well, listen, I'm going to turn off the recording now. And thanks all for hanging in. And, and look, we've got a couple of weeks. These are all good questions. And these are difficult things. How do you, you know, showing your research sources and these kinds of presentations, you want to do it so that it doesn't interfere with the overall kind of visual elegance and simplicity of your slides. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that you're acknowledging your sources in a way that's easy for us to follow. So this is always sometimes takes a bit of thought. And that'll be something that you can certainly take up with your, your CI a little bit. That's a good thing to have a discussion about in your, in your CI meetings. Okay.